<laughs> this is uh, the start of a week of events to celebrate International Women's Week. Uh, but we do allow men in as well, obviously, if you behave. <laughs> it's also the start of uh, the Dundee Women's Science Festival. Uh, so it's only appropriate that we should have three Dundee Women of Science here. And I represent the international element because I'm for five. <laughs> I'm briefly going to introduce the, the panel to you before we uh, get started on the, the serious business of the evening. There will be an opportunity at, at the end of our, our conversation here uh, for you to ask questions. There will be a, a time for Q&A at the end of the, the session. So if you have anything pressing that uh, occurs to you while we're talking, if you could hold back till the end of the, the event, that would, be, that would be useful. And if nobody has any questions, I'll just start picking on people at random. So <laughs> it would be wise to think of something. <laughs> On my extreme left here is Professor Sue Black, who many of you will know. Uh, she's a professor here at the university in charge of CAHI, the Centre for Anatomy and Human Identity. She's bra the brains behind the Million for a Morgue campaign. She's originally from Inverness, and she was brought up in the wastes of Argyll. Uh, she managed to parlay her holiday job in a butcher shop into pursuing a career in anatomy at Aberdeen. <laughs> Uh, and then moved into forensic anthropology, which she has described to me as bringing the dead back to their families. Amongst her investigative work outside the ambience of, of academe, I've been investigating mass graves in Kosovo and in Iraq, and she's currently involved in investigating alleged Syrian torture atrocities. She's had quite a busy week this week. <coughs> she's been to Buckingham Palace to receive the Queen's anniversary prize for higher education. <coughs> Uh, she's also been. Oh, thank you. Oh. You're very kind. Don't applaud. She's big-headed enough. <laughs> <laughs> she's also been featured on Radio 4 as the Life Scientific this week. If you haven't heard it already, I urge you to go away back home and listen to it again on your iPlayer because it's a remarkable program. Uh, which is interviewed by Jim Al Khalili, a program that's already been so well received by listeners to Radio 4 that it's going to be nominated for a Sony Award. And further to that, she's also been given a Wolfson Research Merit Award, which I'm told is a very highly sought after award in the field of research. I wouldn't know, I don't do any research, I just <laughs> buy people drinks and say, What happens if this happens? <laughs> <laughs> now, I did want to bring you some information about each of our guests tonight that isn't what you'll find on their CV. Um, and so uh, I, I, I thought what you might like to know about Sue is her active involvement with a website called... No! No! Can I just say, when this comes out, this has nothing to do with me. I absolutely absolved myself of the responsibility for this. The website is called Show Your Dick. <laughs> Some of you may know that Sue's work centres on, on human identification and, 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 and she has done extensive work on vein pattern analysis. Apparently the, 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 the patterns of, of the major veins in our hands and our arms are, are, are very distinct. And Sue thought that this might apply to other parts of the anatomy. <laughs> And she did try to get the Royal Marines to help with her <laughs> did. research database, but when that failed, she became, she became an adherent of the site showyourdick.com, <laughs> which actually does have genuinely a scientific basis. So, gentlemen, if you would like to help <laughs> in this research project, you can go to this website and it tells you what to do. <laughs> I'm really worried now. <laughs> so would be if I was you. It's <laughs> Professor Neve Nick Dade, who, in spite of the fact that she sounds Irish, was in fact born in Dundee. Neve is the first woman professor of chemistry in 211 years at Strathclyde University. Hey. <laughs> and she specialises in fire scene investigation, illegal drugs and terrorism. Investigating them, I should say. <laughs> committing them. Um, well, as I say, she was born in Dundee, but moved to Ireland at a very early age. Um, read chemistry and maths at Trinity College Dublin. 
ultimately got into fire investigation because she knew a bit about it. Her parents were the first fire invest independent fire investigators in Ireland. And she, got, she followed in their footsteps, really, because she was irritated at how badly it was being taught. <laughs> now, the thing that's not on Neve's CD... <laughs> what have you done? What have you done? <laughs> ..is that she is the Walter White of Strathclyde. <laughs> <laughs> because amongst her, her, her work involved in, in illegal drugs was, was a project to see if you could trace whether particular batches of drugs had all been made by the same manufacturer? Did they all come from the same lab or whatever? And so in order to do this, Neve has had to create large quantities of crystal methamphetamine. <laughs> <laughs> and did in fact tell me, she said, quite, quite proudly, said, I have a cupboard full of crystal meth, you know. <laughs> That's how I and fund my research, though. Father admitted <laughs> to sending out her postgraduate students to pharmacies all over Glasgow to buy Sudafed, which is one of the primary ingredients in making crystal meth. So it's good to see what our, reef, uh, what our, 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 our taxpayers' research funds are being used for. Thanks for that. So then, you're welcome. Perhaps you'll tell us about the Pantone test for cocaine later. Now, sitting next to me here, I'm looking very worried. <laughs> <laughs> it's Alison Leslie. Uh, Alison is currently working with, uh, with Suet Cahid uh, and, and the social work department here at Dundee, piloting the National Child Death Review Process for Scotland, which is a process that ultimately aims at reducing the number of deaths of children we have in Scotland, which currently runs at about 500 a year, I believe. Alison was let, educated here at Morgan Academy and then at St Hughes College, Oxford. A beginning of, beginning of her career in social work and teaching led her to over 20 years of working on case reviews and chairing inquiries into child protection and child fatality cases right across the United Kingdom jurisdictions. Among the cases she's been involved in is Baby P, Peter Connolly, Shannon Matthews abduction, and she's currently involved in the independent inquiry into Jersey care homes, which is looking at child abuse since 1945 in Jersey. Now, What's not on the CV? <laughs> it's actually something that, that, that we have in common. As we both went uh, in, in the early 1970s from Scotland to Oxford, and we both experienced the culture shock of going from Scotland in the early 1970s to Oxford. Now, some of you may remember that in Scotland in the early 1970s there were only three vegetables. <laughs> You were lucky there might be cauliflower now and again. And tinned peas. And tinned peas, I not forget the tinned peas. And we went off to, to Oxford where they had all sorts of exotic vegetables like um, celery and, and broccoli and spinach, things like that. I mean, when I first saw broccoli, I'm sure, like, like you, I thought it was just a cauliflower that had gone fusty. <laughs> Culture, but the real difficulty was real with the food. And, and I believe that you had a similar experience to me with pizza. I did, yes. Yeah. The first time I was asked, I was told sort of we're going for pizza. I had no idea whether you ate it or did it. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I was, I was slightly, I was in a slightly better position than you with regard to the pizza because I, I knew what a pizza was. So I was astounded when this round flat thing appeared in front of me. And I'm like, no, 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 no. A pizza's half moon shaped and covered in batter. <laughs> So, so we've learned a little bit about, uh, about the, the background and, and, and experiences of our panel here tonight. Um, and it's, I'm now going to ask them some questions and let them do some talking. And I wonder if you could, uh, we all have, you know, sort of notions in our head of, of what people like you actually do, but could you perhaps enlighten us about what your job actually does entail, if you could start soon? Oh, I, th I think like any academic, there are, there are huge swathes of what you do you'd rather not do. So I've got a slide that I use when um, I'm talking to schools that show the kinds of things, and I put lots of things up. And of course, the big one that comes up is administration. You know, you're an academic, you're in a university, there's administration. And those are the bits that take up a lot of your time, but you'd rather they didn't. And so you kind of have to ignore the cake and just go straight to the icing. So if somebody said to me, you know, what's, what's the most exciting bit of the day that you do? Um, when I went out very recently to Doha, um, looking at these alleged atrocities from Syria, 
it was the fact that, you know, the ministerial car picks you up from your suite at the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just slip that in? Um, and you, you go to the safe house by a different route every time. You arrive at the safe house, you're patted down to check you're not carrying a wire. The guy behind you is security, they've got their packing in their holsters. It's just such a buzz for a middle-aged woman, you know, to, to be involved in that kind of, and why wouldn't you? So I, I love the fact that when we have casework either at home or overseas, it is unpredictable. And that's the most important bit. The minute your work becomes predictable, it becomes something that can become quite dreary and, and tedious. It never does in our job because every single case that we work, every situation that we're in is different. And, and if you could just have that and nothing else, the job would be perfect. But it's an academic job. So it's meetings and administration and paperwork and yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Why do I have to go after her? That's not fair. <laughs> um, to go after her. I know, that's true, isn't it? Um, off, no. <laughs> Enough said. Um, I think, I mean, I, I, I would echo what Sue said, and, and, you know, academic life is about administration, it's about teaching, it's about providing um, access to, to, or wider access to education. Um, I suppose I'll pick on, on two things that make my, or have recently made my job a little bit more interesting and, and perhaps a little bit more dynamic. And one is running a massive open online course, which was the first one that my university dipped its toe in the water with. And we persuaded the university that, you know, maybe doing something in forensic science might be cool and sexy and a few people might like it. 27,000 people signed up for this course, which frankly was a little scary. Um, but we managed it and, and, and delivered it, and it, it went down really, really well. Um, so that, was, that, that kind of kept me on my toes for a bit. Uh, and another example, I think, uh, as Sue said, is, is around casework. Um, I was very fortunate to work with um, a, a gentleman from the fire service in Derby, and we were planning um, uh, a project. He, he was doing a master's degree with us, um, or, or with me, and he was, we were planning a project, and he had just come off the Philpot case where six uh, children lost their lives. And we did the project around a piece of inform information that was important in relation to that case, which was about why the smoke detectors in the house didn't wake the children. Um, and so we did some research in relation to that, um, very illuminating. Um, and that's, that, again, was something that was really important. And it was something that it was a real privilege to be able to, to have an opportunity to do work in. So, Yes, the admin is, is tedious. Yes, we have to do it. Um, but there are opportunities and times where just for a moment we have an opportunity to really have an impact in our work. And that's what keeps it alive for me. And so it's those outcomes that, that lead to yeah. changes in the way that we do things, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So was, the, was, that, was that the research that was about kids just don't hear smoke alarms in their sleep? Yeah. Eighty percent of children didn't wake up. Yeah. In the, in the tests we did, which was, it was, I was speaking to Scottish Government about it only yesterday, so about what we're going to do next and how we're going to resolve this, so. Yeah. Perhaps the smoke alarms could just like come down with a large mallet, you know, wake up! <laughs> yes, indeedy. It's, it's like that, perhaps, you know, practical like that. Well, it's, it's really interesting because uh, children respond to the mother's voice, so part of, of, of one of the things that we're looking at doing is recording the mother's voice, sim simply saying, wake up, and that, that's uh, an avenue that, that looks very fruitful to explore. So again, it's one of those things where you, once you've just identified what the issue is, you can then move to a solution. Yeah. yeah. Alison, what does your job actually entail? Um, I think, I was thinking the other day, you know, why it is, despite the kind of things I have to deal with in my work, I, I can't watch Casualty. Because <laughs> you know what it's like on Casualty when it starts. You've got you know, the guy with the electric hedge trimmer <laughs> and the wobbly ladder and the dog running around the garden, and I just can't watch it. And I think, and yet in my work, I sometimes have to deal with, with really awful things that, that you, you, you see and that you hear about. And it, it struck me when I was trying to sort of figure out, well, what is it? Is that the thing about watching Casualty is there's nothing you can do to stop it. You know, something horrendous is going to happen, and even though it's only fiction, you can't do anything about it. And I think, that what is important and special about the work that I do, and it's, I, I think it's where it crosses over the work that Neve does and the work that Sue does, 
is that we come into situations when the very worst has happened, when there has been a devastating tragedy. And yes, it's awful for everyone involved. And yes, it involves sometimes seeing dreadful things. But that is where our work begins. And our work is actually about bringing some tiny bit of order to this terrible devastation and chaos. And I think it's also about trying to bring something redemptive out of it, is, isn't it? It's, you know, in some tiny way, giving people, um, you know, comfort that something will be learned or something will be done as a result of something awful that's happened to a child or to, to a family in, in, in a fire or, or to a whole population. And, and that's, you know, that's the bit, I suppose, that gives me most satisfaction. Um, I think the other thing, I mean, I'm not an academic in the way these guys are, but I mean, I just love the teaching that I do here. I mean, I had uh, this week the, the, the third year BA um, student group in social work. I will, I will sort of, you know, give them the credit. They produced work that was just phenomenal. And there was one particular piece of work that one group did that I couldn't have done and I taught them it. And I think that that is what is so exciting, when you give students the basics and they take the stuff and they go further than you can ever imagine. I think that is just magic. And that sort of is what gets you through, you know, the days that you spend doing the admin and going <laughs> to meetings that you really wouldn't rather be in. So I wonder if I could ask, so we're talking about women in science, and how, how did you come to choose the path that you're on, Sue, or did it, did it choose you? Uh, it chose me, I didn't choose it, and so I, I'm really a very bad um, advertisement for any sort of career, so, so going into school is a really bad idea. <laughs> so, um, you know, they say, how did you do it, and the answer is, well, I, you know, I just sort of fell into it. I've never really made a conscious decision in my life um, about my career. So that either makes me very clever, very stupid, or just totally lazy, but it, it's, it's a combination, probably. Um, when I, I worked in a butcher shop, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I know that, you know, I'm sure I'll go back to it in a future life, but <laughs> when, it then, when it then came to anatomy, that was, that was, that was an opening moment. Just the, this wonderful ability and this wonderful gift to, to open up somebody to look inside and just to see this marvelous, marvelously constructed uh, piece of work. That, that to me was a pivotal moment. So all the way along, I went to, I went to university because my teacher told me I could. I didn't know I could, but he told me I could, so I went. I made my choices simply because I either did anatomy or I did botany, and I hated plants. So <laughs> it wasn't really a, a conscious decision. And when it came to doing the research, all the research in my department was lead levels in rat brain and carcinoma and hamster pituitary, and I'm pathologically terrified of rodents. So I, I couldn't do anything like that. So the only thing open to me was human bone. And so everything that I have done, I'm ashamed to say, from the beginning to this point here, I've just fallen into. I've, I've not made a conscious decision. So I'd like to think it chose me, because I certainly didn't choose it. And my father, who died this year, um, up until he, you know, very shortly before he died, he used to keep saying to me, what are you going to do when you leave school? Because <laughs> as far as he's concerned, I went to university and I never left. <laughs> And, and he, I never really then got a proper job. So I don't, I'm still looking for what I'm going to do. Maybe I should be a crime writer. <laughs> <laughs> know any good role models? Not on one. Not on one. <laughs> I've heard Stuart McBride's very good. <laughs> It was slightly less random than Sue, but it was still, I mean, I echo what you're saying. Both of my parents were scientists. My father was a chemist and my mother is a botanist, sorry, but. Um, and so we were always surrounded by science. We always had um, that sort of level of inquiry, I guess, 
as, as we were growing up. Um, my parents started doing fire scene investigation probably about 37, 38 years ago. And they, um, so it was always in, in you know, that, le that level of inquiry, I guess, was always in the house. And my brother and I, when, when, when we were young, in order to earn our pocket money, because we, we had to do something to earn our pocket money, we used to stick um, their scene photographs onto pieces of paper at five pence a photograph. There was great competition in the house to see who would get the stack of photographs to do. Um, so we were, we were always immersed in this discussion um, about fires, and I vowed I would never, ever go there. Um, so I went to university. Um, we, I, again, we were encouraged to. Uh, it, was, it was always going to be there um, as, as an option for us. And so I went to university, um, did my undergraduate degree. Back in the time when I chose to do postgrad, um, Ireland's economy was not great, so there simply weren't an awful lot of opportunities for graduates coming out to get jobs. So I thought, oh, well, do you know, I'll go off and I'll do a PhD, because kind of, well, OK. So, uh, so that's what I did. Um, and I, I worked in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland for my PhD, so I got exposed to anatomy for the first time. Um, it was down the corridor from us. Um, and from there, I um, uh, had an opportunity to come and, and work at Strathclyde, so I took that. and kind of, as I said, fell into it. It wasn't a particular choice. It was an opportunity that it came my way, and I went, yeah, all right then. Um, so I did. I came to Scotland for two years. 20 years later, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> so, and, and as I said, in terms of the fire scene investigation work that I do now, it was something that I literally fell into. Kind of didn't really want to go there, but ended up by becoming so irritated at the way in which it was being taught um, at the university that I said, I have to do something about this. So now, when I meet up with my mum, when I go back home, um, and she's still, she's in her 70s now, she's still working, so she's still uh, doing, doing fire scenes. And if one comes in when I'm there, I get asked, would I like to go? And so, yes, of course. Um, and so I get to carry the camera, I get to do the digging, um, <laughs> I get quizzed. Um, it's like doing a PhD viva every single time you go in, <laughs> except with your mother, it's really not good. <laughs> really not good. You walk in the door and she sits there, looks at you and says, what do you think then? You think, oh God, I think I'd rather be somewhere else. But <laughs> it's, it's always interesting and illuminating. So yeah, I mean, like, like, uh, like Sue said, uh, it kind of has fallen along as it's fallen along, but you know. Does she still pay you five feet to stick pictures in the bottom? I wish. Oh. No, I'm afraid now I do the labour for free. It's for love, you know. So. But no, I'm afraid not. Alison, what about yourself? Um, I think when I was very small, I, I decided I wanted to, to go to university, even though nobody had ever gone to university in our family, um, because there were lots of books there. And it seemed to me that, was, that would be a great thing to do, to go to some place where there's lots of books. And at some, some point on some film, um, there was, I, I saw Oxford, and I thought, that looks a nice place, I'll go there. And nobody <laughs> told me it was difficult, you know? <laughs> I just thought, you know. Um, so I did. And, uh, which kind of was, you know, a bit of a, a shock to every system. But I think one of the great things that um, you learn there um, is that there isn't the structure that there is in a lot of our courses. And you'll have the same experience. You know, you arrive one day and you're told, sort of, you know, for, you know, 40 hours later, you have to produce sort of, you know, 4,000 wor words on Tennyson or sort of <laughs> Emily Bronte or something, and you're not given a title for the essay. You're just told to go and write on it. Um, and in my second year, I took the English language option, which is really all about sort of, you know, analysis and patterns and language. And the first thing, you know, I was told to do was I was given this thing that was written in Mercian, which was a language I didn't know, and asked to translate it into Anglo-Saxon, which was another language I didn't know. <laughs> because I had passed the Anglo-Saxon sort of paper by sort of getting the crib from my college mother, who'd got it from her college mother. You know, we all <laughs> used the same thing. Um, but what that taught you to do was to look for patterns, and it, it taught you sort of, you know, problem solving. And I think that that stayed with me. Um, I did, after university, I did teacher training in Sheffield. And uh, when I came back to Dundee, because all my qualifications had been done in England, I had to register as a foreign student <laughs> <laughs> to get my, my teacher training accreditation. And that took about a year to come through. And in that year, I got a job working with children who'd been excluded from school. And, and I absolutely loved it. And at the end of that year, I was offered a job in the local social work team 
and I was offered a job uh, teaching in, in a local school. And I wasn't sure which one to go for, but many years before, um, I had heard a talk by a lady called Margaret Imley, who I now know, she lives in, in Newport, and uh, she'd been talking about her work as a social worker, and it just sounded so interesting. And it was all about sort of, you know, gathering information and making sense of it. And I thought, that might be quite interesting, I thought. Um, and that was how I kind of drifted into social work. And uh, I got very interested very early on in, in sort of patterns and statistics and data and how you could use data to, to make changes. And in due course, I ended up sort of in a management position in social work. And I decided I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing that. So I became self-employed, did started doing bits of research, and I think it was about 1993, um, I got asked to sit on an inquiry in Newcastle. Um, and after that, I got asked to do another one and another, and then you know, 20 years later, I was still doing it. Um, in between, I've done all sorts of other things, but uh, I also, a few years ago, started doing the odd teach, bit of teaching at the uh, University of Huddersfield, and that was what kind of led me to, to come and do some stuff here as well. So you've all had this, this element of, of, of serendipity, the way things sort of falling in, in yeah. front of you, you kind of tripped over and thought, that's really interesting. And, and that kind of ties in with what I was going to ask about, talk about next, is that, that there's been some research that when women are much more inclined towards interdisciplinary relationships, they're, they're much more inclined to share their knowledge across different disciplines, to work with people who are, are working in different fields that are connected to the work they're doing. Um, and I think this sometimes leads to thinking outside the box, and in a way you've all, in, in the work that you've done, you've all done stuff that's, that's thinking outside the box. Do, do you think that, that, that this is something that, that is, because women are more collegial rather than directly careerist, that, that we actually enjoy working together and that we understand about, about networking in a different way perhaps than the way men do it? What we tend to do is we tend to decide who's going to buy the cake. Yeah, that's okay. right. And that becomes the central core of yeah. whose responsibility it is to buy the cake. And once you've bought cake, you've broken down every single mm -hmm. barrier that was there. And, and everything that I've done with these, these ladies who I, I hold in, in extreme regard has really been, we sat down with cake and we thought, what can we do? That's what, fun. What, what we can we do? Fun. We need to do fun. Yeah. It needs mm. to be fun. And I think women are very good at, at talking around a subject and finding an angle that brings in the unexpected, if you like. So w perhaps we're less focused initially, but much more inclusive. So that, you know, we sat down and we said, right, you know, how do we make a child death review work? We sat down like two schoolgirls the other day um, <laughs> when we were at Scottish Enterprise, and there was this wonderful moment when a business trainer said to us, imagine if the research council stopped funding, what would happen to your research? And everybody in the room went, oh, horrendous. And we went, yay, yay we wouldn't notice any different because they don't fund us anyway. And it was the most wonderful, sort of, you know, cathartic moment. They went, oh, I have an idea, let's go. And it always starts with, I've had an idea. Yeah, but the thing is, it always starts at about sort of, you know, 11.45 p.m. You get an email from Sue saying, I've had an idea. And then the next thing, sort of, this one comes in, sort of, and says, oh, that's great. And we could get sort of the Forestry Commission and the Coast Guard and the Women's Institute and the Salvation Army and Interpol will fund it. And after a wee while, sort of, you know, they're going back and forth, and it's now about 2 a.m. She's got us to her teeth. They're going she? back and forward between them. And I think, oh, I'll try, see if sort of they'll fall for this. So I sort of email them and say, okay, and, you know, something like, let's do it in Latin. And let's do it on the International Space Station. <laughs> and you get a pause, and then you get them going, yeah! <laughs> and then Sue goes, and we'll get Val McDermott. Yeah, 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 There you go. That's it. That's, it. That's what interdisciplinary is about. Sue, an idea or a favour. I think, yeah. run for the hills! <laughs> 
And I think, yes. I mean, the voice of sanity is usually Fiona, who about three or four days later, yeah. Fiona's sometimes a bit like the dormouse in Alice in Wonderland. Every so often she sort of kind of wakes up and goes, oh my goodness, should I be doing yes. something? <laughs> Wait a minute, you lot sort of draw in sort of sanity. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Can, can I ask, can I ask on, a, on a, a really se a serious question in relation to this is, what kind of cake works best? <laughs> Chocolate cake. Chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate. 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 No. 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 Okay. Scones. What do you prefer? What's, uh, I, what's the way to get your juices flowing? Uh, yum yums. <laughs> <laughs> or tonics, caramel wafers. <laughs> you paying attention here. You know, you want a research project to get off the ground. It's actually, it's actually a very good test if there's going to be a good working relationship in a project. You know, if I find myself working with people who aren't always sort of stopping for a cup of tea and a cake, you think this is never going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> ideas from and I want to go oh, for God's sake um, but I think the one that, that has the same effect on you but nevertheless is the one that people want to know the answer to is how your work affects you emotionally what cases stay with you how, how do you come home at the end of the day and switch off from the things that you have been dealing with all day the things that, that most people would would run a mile to to not ever have to deal with but ever have to confront I mean I, I think it's it's you, you have to take a professional stance and you compartmentalize what you're doing. You can't get emotionally involved in it because if you do get emotionally involved, then you're not helping the people that you're there to help and you're not uh, a, a, a truth finder and that's, that's what we're there for. Um, so you can, you can do the emotional bit later, privately, but not while you're involved in the case. And, and we compartmentalize it. That's how we, we do our business. That's, we're there to bring the science to the service of the court to find the truth um, and that's how, how certainly how I would go through it. I think that's very true but I think you know there are people who have much more difficult jobs than mm -hmm. we do mm -hmm. so my secretary um, Vivian has a much more difficult job than I do wherever she is. Where is she? There she is. Look, stick your head up. <laughs> stick your hand up Viv. Don't think like you're not going to get out of this. <laughs> But she, she has a much more difficult than job than I do because every single day she takes the phone calls from people who says, I've just lost my husband, mm. I've just lost my wife, I've just lost my mum or my dad. And the job that she does, I think, is incredibly difficult because you are dealing with the raw emotions of the living. When I get to do my job, I'm not dealing with that. I'm dealing with a situation that has moved on. We now have the deceased. I can't help them. I can't make them feel any better. And therefore, I'm about justice. What she has to do is she has to talk to people and to talk to them in a way that makes them feel that they can trust her, that, that they can place all of their faith in her to do this job. And she's the bequeathal secretary for the entirety of the university. So every single phone call that comes in in that nature, she has to deal with. There are people with much more difficult jobs than we are. What we see is, is horrendous. It, it is an absolutely horrendous vista that is often in front of us. But it doesn't get to the emotional level that it does with the kind of job that, that Vivian does. Before you come to us, I just want to make a brief commercial here. If any of you would like to do something useful with your body after you die, that bag of flesh and bones that's all that's left after what it is that animates you goes away, then you should talk to Sue's department about bequeathing your body so the next generation of anatomists and anthropologists and surgeons and pathologists can understand the human body and the processes that take us all from the cradle to the grave. It's a really, really important work that they do. And I've, I've been inside that anatomy lab and I have seen the respect and the dignity that Sue and her team bring to the bodies that are left to them to work on and to work with. So if you have any you know, idea at all about wanting to contribute to the valuable work that goes on here, that is an avenue that's open to you. So that's the commercial... And I'll, I'll give you all Vivian's phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not coming to work on this. <laughs> what would be news? <laughs> Alice, for you, how does it, how does it, how does it work, that, that sense of emotional commitment and involvement? I think, I think it's the same as, as Neve. You, you, you learn to put 
um, things into a separate compartment. You, you've got to be professional. Um, I, I do often have to um, you know, meet with people who have maybe lost a, a child or a grandchild in horrific circumstances and may also have lost another family member who has been, say, charged with the, the murder of that child. And the last thing they need is, is for you to be you know, emotional about it. What they want is you to give a, a bit of what I said er earlier, that sort of brings some kind of sense of order and give them you know, just even a tiny shred of hope that something can be redeemed from this. And I, I, I don't think it's that you need to be, I don't think people are, have to be particularly you know, tough or, or, or hard hearted. I mean, you know, I said I couldn't watch Casualty. I can't watch 101 Dalmatians. You know, <laughs> that woman, the coat, the puppies. I still can't watch it all the way through. But you learn with these things that you put it in, in into one compartment. And I think the other thing that, um, well, so two things really. I say, you know, help me enormously in my work. One is that in every awful situation I've had to encounter, you meet people such as bereaved rel relatives who show such incredible dignity and courage that you are just awed at you know, what the human spirit can endure and come through, and, and you're humbled by it. Um, and I think the other thing I've found and become very aware of really just in recent months has been that the work that I've been doing at university and the links that I've had you know, with Sue and at Strathclyde with, with Neve, that for the, I've realized that for the first time in the last 20 odd years, I'm in a situation where I can talk more freely about our work because I hadn't realised how much I actually censor. Because it's not the kind of stuff, you know, when you go home and you're sort of, you know, sitting with your, your family or your friends, you know, and they say what kind of day that you've had, you don't actually want to hear the stuff, you know. <laughs> but this is a sort of setting where you can talk and where people do understand and you can almost talk in code because yeah. you, shorthand, you, you, because yeah. people understand yeah. what you're dealing with and why, yeah. And it is useful to know that at any point in the future I can completely intimidate you by creeping up behind you and going, Cruella. Oh, don't <laughs> 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 Cruella. Cruella. <laughs> She'll never be allowed. <laughs> um, before, we, before we hand over to, to questions from the audience, um, since this is the beginning of International Women's Week, um, as pioneering women here sitting in front of us all, what advice would you give to young women today starting out on, on a career path in the sciences? Um, I, I can honestly say, um, and this is not because um, the principal's in the room, but <laughs> it helps that he is, um, is the fact that th there is no limit. And at this mm -hmm. university, I have never been aware of the fact that being a woman has in any way been anything deleterious. So it doesn't matter in this university, whether you're a man or a woman or anything in between, um, there, there is in fact no barrier, there is no glass ceiling. And I think for, for young women entering science, it's about having belief in yourself. It's about finding what is your passion. What is it that really gets you going? And stick with it. Have absolute and utter determination to get where you want to go. And if you're in the right institution, there won't be anything in your way to stop that happening. I think um, for me, when, when I was growing up, my, my mother is a fantastic role model because she uh, broke all the rules um, in terms of achieving what she wanted to achieve. Um, and she was spurred on by, by her mother, my grandmother. And when I was um, uh, going to university and when I decided that I wanted to do my PhD and all the rest of it, um, they said the same thing to me, is you can do whatever you want to do. Um, the only thing I can't do is spell. Uh, anybody <laughs> who ever knows me will know I really can't spell. But apart from that, that's what spell checkers are for. But apart from that, um, they, I was always given that encouragement that, that absolutely, if you have the opportunities presented in front of you, um, you really have to grasp those opportunities with both hands and run with it. For me personally, when I became professor, um, which was only a couple of, of years ago, um, one of the comments, or a number of comments that I got from my colleagues were, oh, that's fantastic, you've broken the glass ceiling. And my response was, well, why was there a glass ceiling? There shouldn't be, um, because there shouldn't be anything that prevents women 
from achieving, and young women from achieving whatever it is their goal is. It's there for the taking. But I agree with Sue. It, you need to be in an environment that will mentor you, that will nurture you, and that will give you those opportunities and let you run with it. I, I think I, I would sort of pretty much agree with what uh, Sue and Eve have said. I think the thing is just to see no limits. And, you know, I've also found it very useful to ask forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it would be Eddie Small. <laughs> um, I feel quite savagely numbered tonight sitting here, I must be honest. Um, I'm here because I see the four people in front of me as being wonderful um, ambassadors for womanhood and for, for what women do. But, I, but I'm also worried at the same time. I know that in, in this university we have... Um, three women students for every two male students. And in the fields that you're in, particularly, Sue, there are many, many more female students than there are male students. I wonder if you've got any concerns whether women are beginning to get too strong. There was, a, there was a wonderful quote which will go down history. It was, it was one of the politicians who had said um, when the, the balance changed in medical student numbers, when it went to the point that over 50% of medical students were female, he said, what a shame, because it's clear that the discipline's going downhill. <laughs> um, and that's really interesting. I, I think we do have to be careful because I think what we do need is a balance. Yeah. And, and we desperately do need more men um, into some of the disciplines that we have. And what we don't understand, I don't think fully, is why some disciplines attract females more than males, males more than females. If we could understand that, and there's a research project, then, you know, but do we want to genetically engineer the balance? Um, you know, I think we're, we're playing then with, with uh, nature. So I know that my students find it hard because, you know, it is nine females for every one male in forensic anthropology. All the professors in the subject are female. And in fact, 95% of the practitioners are female. It's an incredibly female-oriented profession. We don't know why. We genuinely don't know why it is that it attracts females, that it retains females. But at the same token, what it does is it promotes as well. So wh wherever the, the balance is, um, and I think, you know, artificially, if we try to get to the 50-50, no one's going to be happy. I think we've just got to get to a point where we, we can understand that, that male-dominated brains are going to be drawn to one area. Female-dominated brains are probably going to be drawn to another. And we've, we've really just got to accept it. I blame history cold case. You blame history cold case. <laughs> I blame history cold case for everything. Yeah. <laughs> I think all joking apart, I think, I think this, the, the thing that you said there about the medical profession is an absolute uh, exemplar of the way that however hard we try, we still live in a fundamentally patriarchal society. Um, and, and as an exemplar of this, I would, I would say, look at the publishing industry. It used to be that the publishing industry, editorial side, was run predominantly by men. Over the last 30 years, women have increasingly become powerful figures within the editorial side of publishing. They've become editorial directors, they've become the publishers of the list. And lo and behold, where is the power shifted to in publishing? Sales and marketing. <laughs> and who runs sales and marketing still? The guys. <laughs> so I think you know, that, that, that um, when, when, when women do start to, to occupy a mathematical uh, superiority, very often in subtle ways the power is shifted away from those areas to other areas. So we still have a long, long way to go before there's any risk at all of the women becoming superior across the, the scale. We're a long, long way from a matriarchy. I think um, I, I'd add, um, maybe to, to broaden it a little bit, in terms of forensic science and the program that, that I teach um, at Strathclyde, we have probably about four or five women to every man that comes through our, our hands to do the, the MSc in forensic science. 
when you look at the profession, the practitioners out there, there's a lot of women, obviously, in the pr profession. But when you, when you look at the tiers um, and you look at uh, where the, 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 the people that rise to the, to the top of the profession in terms of directors of laboratories, there are very, very few women. Very few. So the women stay at the bench and they stay doing the, the, the sort of uh, cold face. But once it gets into management, certainly in forensic science, there's very few women that are there. In fire scene investigation, very scant. Very, very scant. There's, there's, you could count them, I think, on two hands for the, for the entirety of the UK in terms of how many women do fire scene investigation. So it's not, it's, the balance is not quite as you say, mm. I think. I, I think you've also got to look at it in the context of you know, how far we've come in a relatively short time because you know, my grandmother was born into a world where she didn't have a vote. Um, you know, in my lifetime, sort of men and women were being paid different rates for doing the same job. And a lot has happened in the last you know, 20, 30 years. And I think things, you know, the pendulum's got to swing one way before it, it finds a balance. But I think the point that, that, that sort of Neve has made about where women are in organisations, if you look in medicine, yes, you'll find lots of women going into, say, general practice, but the number of female surgeons. Mm. Uh, sort of consultant surgeons in certain disciplines is still very few. In social work, when I started, 90% of the staff were female and 10% of the management was female. That has shifted quite a lot, but there's still sort of been you know, a way to go. Mm. No, constant war of attrition. <laughs> May I have a question? Yes. Just wait a second for the mic. Um, Harriet Harman and some of her uh, some other prominent female um, politicians have been in the news recently, um, and I wondered what the view was in our women here on the, on the general issue of the the paedophile, paedophile exchange and whether um, it matters now what they thought then or whether it does matter. I think it matters very much to yeah. victims, and I yeah. think yeah. that the, 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 I think there was a, a, a report today of one of uh, a guy who's now a judge who, as a student member, when he heard that that organisation being affiliated to uh, the National Council Council Civil Liberties had resigned, and I thought, you know, if a young lad sort of understands the right thing, what on earth were these sort of you know mature politicians, you know, mature professionals thinking? I think, you know, coming into the, the paedophile world, which I know quite a bit about, unfortunately, because of the research that I do, we, we expect women to behave differently and, than men, and we shouldn't, because when we look at many of the paedophile cases, there is a woman involved, because the women are in a position where we trust them with our children, they are above suspicion. And as a result, they are frequently involved in the perpetration of these crimes. So women are an incredibly important player in this. And so I'm not at all surprised to find women involved in that. But it's always a surprise when it's somebody that turns out to be so high profile. 40% 40, 40 of all paedophile cases will have a woman involved somewhere. And it may well be that it is just simply as a result of allowing somebody to have access to their children or being the person that's responsible for taking the photographs to then sell them on. I think, um, I, I can remember the time when, when, when the paedophile information exchange was, was around and, and, and was, was affiliated to NCC. I remember, I remember being completely baffled at, at why this was, was happening. Um, but I think there were, there were people around at that time who were so absolutely uh, committed to the idea of libertarianism that they kind of forgot that that, that things like paedophile information exchange actually affected people, the, yeah. the, the, that there were children involved in this. It wasn't just some kind of abstract idea of mm -hmm. libertarianism that, that everyone should have the right to express their own sexuality or their own views or whatever. And I think that the victims got lost in all of that at the time. Um, we were a lot less enlightened also back then about, about the, the, um, the prevalence of paedophilia and the nature of paedophilia, but it doesn't excuse that kind of, 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 I suppose, carelessness at the time. Yeah. Anybody else? Look? I feel like a bit of a lightweight now. Um, I actually wanted to, to um, ask about the um, 
at your experience at Dundee, Sue, like you said that um, you didn't experience a glass ceiling, you had no issues kind of moving up through. I mean, obviously, as um, as Neve mentioned, you know, there's there's still that drop off. You have the massive, you know, over representation. Well, a massive representation of women over over men at kind of undergraduate level. You know, it's still kind of it's it's creeping up, but there's still a massive drop off when it comes to people running labs. Um, even in places like Dundee, they're actually doing really really well. I guess my question is how you feel about that, but also, what is it you think that Dundee is doing? right that's meaning that we're moving in a good direction? I, I think we have some incredible role models in Dundee. So the vice principal for life sciences, life sciences is a subject for which Dundee is known across the world and she's hanging her head. So <laughs> Doreen Cantrell who is the vice principal for life sciences, you can't have a better role model and whilst it was very nice of you to applaud for I went you know to the palace to pick something up she was awarded a CBE this year for the work that she does. And that deserves... <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> so so you, 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 have you have people like Doreen. And although she's on her f mobile phone at the moment, you have people <laughs> like Professor Nat Kinka up there, in Kanatka up there. Yeah. Are you? <laughs> so that you, you have great women who are really strong personalities, who don't take no for an answer, as the principal will attest to. They simply <laughs> don't. And they're influencing what happens in their labs. And, and I think in Dundee, we're not afraid for women to go into those kinds of roles. And although you know, th th there will always be areas where there are drop-offs, I think we've got the role models, and we're not afraid to have the role models, and we're not afraid to celebrate the role models. And that's what makes us different. Our deputy principals, um, where is she? There she is, Georgina. <laughs> so Georgina Follett, myself, Margaret Smith, deputy principals, all three out of, how many do we have in total? Four, thank you. So three <laughs> out of four deputy principals are women. It shows that, that this university is committed, hopefully, to putting the right people in the right place, not whether they have certain internal anatomy or otherwise. <laughs> My principal, when he, when he was, I can embarrass him now, when he was um, Dean of Life Sciences, used to invite me to, to meetings. And it would be to discuss various equality issues. And he used to know to leave me till right to the end. And he'd say, Sue, what's your opinion? I'd say, do you want my opinion, or are you asking me because I've got a uterus? <laughs> Only an anatomist can ever get away with that question. <laughs> He always answered the right way, kind of thing. <laughs> um, perhaps with the nature of the um, discussion in your individual departments, it's um, on a slightly more general notice, but you were talking about um, the differences, perhaps revealing differences within the bottom layers of certain, certain professions and higher up. And I was wondering, either in general or in your individual departments and fields, what your opinions were on quotas for women, or in general? Absolutely against them. <laughs> I, I think it doesn't ultimately do um, women or anyone any good if people um, get to the, 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 you know, sort of get to the position um, because it's been engineered for them. I, th I think, I mean, some years, you know, I mentioned that, you know, in my early days in social work, you know, ten, only 10% 10 of um, sort of management were, were women, of only 90% of the staff were. And, you know, some of us did some research, we did research across three authorities as to why that was. And the reason women weren't in management was because they weren't applying. And so, the answer was not to say, okay, we'll appoint sort of 50% of our managers will be women. The answer was actually to work with women about why it was they weren't applying for promoted posts and to sort of, some of it was about confidence. One of the things we found in our research, which is replicated in a lot of research, is that um, in general, uh, if a post is advertised, promoted post, a man will apply thinking, I'll get on top of that when I get in there. A woman, women tend to think, I really need to get more qualifications or more experience before I can apply. And some of it's actually about giving women the confidence to, to have a go and giving them support once they are appointed, as you would do with men, to you know, mentoring them once they're in post so that they do master it. 
I mean, for, for me, it's, um, again, I echo what Alison said, um, it's, it's not about quotas. I don't think the quotas will work. It gets back to um, some of the discussion that we've had earlier about the 50-50 balance or whatever. I think that if women, and, and young women in particular, are provided with a nurturing environment that provides them or gives them the opportunities to develop themselves, and they are given those opportunities, and they take those opportunities, then there is absolutely no reason why they shouldn't get to the top of their professions. Absolutely none. On the other hand, I'm going to be slightly devil's advocate for a moment. I'm not entirely, I'm, I think there are problems, huge problems with quotas. But I think for a very, very long time, we would have had to deal with the quota going in the opposite direction. I can remember when I was in journalism back in the 1980s, um, I was the mother of the chapel, the, the trade union official for, for my office, and uh, we had a job vacancy coming up, and I went in to have a word with the editor. We were a Sunday paper, but on a Saturday we had to operate like a daily paper, so we had lots of, of casual staff who came in and worked for us on the Saturday. And I went in and I said to the editor, is this woman who's been doing casual shifts for us for about 18 months on a, on, on a Saturday, she works for the Yorkshire Post, she's a really good journalist, if we don't give her a job, somebody else will, and then we'll be sorry. And he looked at me with complete bafflement and said, but why do we need another woman? We've got you. <laughs> now, there was a quota working in reverse. So having been on, if you like, the receiving end of that, I do sometimes incline towards saying we should perhaps be offering a helping hand to increase the numbers, whether that's encouraging women or mentoring women or whatever, but we should take a positive step to work against those kind of mindsets that have been operating against us for so many years. Before, before we close, um, I have one question I'd like uh, also to ask the, the panel before we finish up. Knowing what you know now, <laughs> what would you do differently? <laughs> I'm talking about your work, obviously, Sue. I'll go last. <laughs> later. <laughs> I think no, knowing what I know now, what would I have done differently? Probably not very much. I think that um, the, the way in which my career has developed has been a real adventure. It's been a step into the unknown pretty much every day these days. Um, and maybe what I would have done differently is made a few more opportunities for myself as I went along. I tend to, I tend to, have, I tend to have gotten better at that. Um, and not being too afraid of what people think about what I do and what I say, um, because that's quite, quite liberating. And having a bit more fun, that's, I think, really going to be quite important in the years to come. Awesome. Probably nothing. I mean, <laughs> my, my life is, it has, it, it is hard when you have to be independent in your work because you can't, um, sort of compromise on that and very often you are not delivering the answers to people that they want to hear and, and it can be tough but I think it's been worth it because at the end of the day I think I can sort of turn around and say you know despite everything I did my best and my life has just been so incredibly blessed and enriched by the people I have known along the way and, and the friends I've made and the colleagues I've had I wouldn't swap it for a fortune. <laughs> I'd have placed money on Stuart McBride winning the mortgage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is such a running sore. <laughs> such a running sore. I should have regret re <laughs> um, I, I think probably on the panel more than anyone, I, I realise that you are a very, very long time dead. And in doing that, this is not a rehearsal. You know, we have to live every single day. And I don't think we can afford to have regrets. I don't think we can afford to go back and think, what if I'd gone the other way? You made the choice. You've got to live it now. You've got to make the best of it. I wouldn't change a damn thing.
be a you know, suitable, uh, suitable introduction well to the, the vote of thanks that I now have to give. In fact, I, I now know what it feels like at the end of, or towards the end of a traditional burn supper uh, when uh, a, a, a woman finally gets up and gives the, um, and gives the, um, the reply on behalf of the lasses. And, um, I suppose I'm giving the reply on behalf of the laddies um, t tonight after this uh, fantastic and wonderful uh, evening. And I'm not, e I'm not going to try to, uh, to summarise and, and, and praise the things that um, our panellists have spoken about uh, this evening. I'm just going to say uh, a few simple things. Um, thank God uh, we have influential women in our society, in our workplaces, um, uh, in our institutions and throughout our professions. And wouldn't it be a lot better uh, if more of those women uh, rose more easily to the top as we discussed in the final part uh, of uh, tonight's, um, uh, tonight's panel uh, discussion? And shouldn't we just be rather ashamed um, that in our society that actually still uh, is not the case uh, just now? We've heard how um, these three women found their voices, how they um, came across their professions, largely uh, by um, serendipity. But they have other things in common. Um, they're determined uh, to make a difference in the work that they do. Um, they show incredible humor uh, in the face of enormous adversity and human suffering. Uh, and they are a group that very evidently works together extremely well. I mean, how they've sparked one another off this evening, um, uh, rather like that um, description of the email conversations that take place uh, uh, when the rest of us are sleeping. Uh, there is a huge and enormous spark. Uh, and of course, um, uh, there needs to be somebody to set that spark off. Uh, and uh, I think in Val's chairmanship this evening, we've seen uh, somebody who does that with uh, consummate ease and ability. So we've had enormous insight into the, um, what makes um, three, um, and I would argue four, uh, fantastically, uh, fantastic women at tick. Um, it's been entertaining uh, and poignant uh, and, uh, and exciting for all of us. Uh, so um, I want therefore to ask you all uh, to join me in thanking all four of them for uh, a fantastic evening. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>